So welcome everybody who is just joining us um, for this um, lunchtime webinar. Um, we'll give everyone a couple of minutes um, to get settled um, and join the webinar. Um, hopefully it's a little bit cool wherever you are, if you've managed to find a dark corner of somewhere to work. Um, certainly picked a good day. Um, to do this session. Um, so yeah, welcome. Um, we'll give it a couple more minutes and then we will kick off um, and introduce our panel um, and move into the session. Um, do feel free to use the um, chat function um, if you want to introduce yourself um, and say where you're from um, so we can see who's joined us, that would be great. So we'll just give it a couple more minutes. Okay, we've got, yeah, got a good number of people joined us. Um, so if everyone's good to go, um, I think we'll um, kick off um, with introductions. Um, so a very warm welcome, literally a very warm welcome, I think, uh, to this um, lunchtime webinar session. Um, well, when we'll be um, looking at the uh, manifestos that came out back from the elections in May, um, and talking and reflecting um, with an excellent panel on what this might mean um, for London um, and the wider funding landscape over the next four years. Um, my name's Helen Maffey. I'm one of the directors here at London Funders. Um, and I am going to just introduce very briefly um, our panel before I give a bit of context um, to today's session uh, and what we hope um, to get out of it. Um, so I'm really pleased um, to be joined by Chris French, um, who is uh, the Associate Director um, focusing on research um, here at London Funders, um, who joined us um, earlier in the year. Um, Jahanara Rakumar, who's the Director of Community Investment at Metropolitan Thames Valley. Um, and Rob Whitehead, who's the Director of Strategic Development at the Centre for London. So a big thank you to all three of you um, particularly for joining us on, on this very, very hot day um, to be sharing all your insights and expertise with us. And we're looking forward to the discussion. Um, so just by way um, of introduction um, for the session today. So I think, well, you know, this week we're certainly distracted by other um, leadership elections happening, um, casting our minds back to May, um, local elections um, were taking place um, across London um, with the parties elected making a number of commitments um, to support London's communities um, over the next four years. Um, since then, um, we've, well, Chris has been um, mapping out what issues are being prioritised by the successful parties at a borough-wide level. Um, and this has included areas that we know are important to our members, um, from the climate crisis, support for children and young people, to housing, domestic violence, and the cost of living. Um, so we really want to use this session as a bit of a springboard um, to explore what this might mean for individuals and organisations um, that funders support. Um, so we'll be inviting our panellists to share um, their reflections on what the local election results might mean um, for the wider funding landscape and what the opportunities might be um, to act on the issues that will be high on the agenda um, over the next four years. Um, so just before I hand over um, to Chris um, to kick us off, um, as you'll have gathered, um, this is a webinar format. Um, we'll be recording the session so we can share it more widely um, with uh, across our membership and others who weren't able to join today. Um, we would encourage you to please use the Q&A um, function throughout the session as questions occur to you. Um, please use this um, to ask questions to any of the panel um, because we'd like to come back um, for plenty of time to hear these um, towards the end of the session. Um, 
Okay, I think that's my my introductions done. Um, so Chris, I'm going to start and, and hand over to you um, to tell us a bit more um, about what you found um, from from doing this mapping exercise. Thanks very much, Helen, and hi everyone. Um, yep, yeah, my name is Chris French, and uh, joined recently, as Helen said. So it's been really uh, exciting, actually, for this to be the first project that I've undertaken with London funders. Um, so, as you know, all 32 London boroughs uh, went through uh, the election process in May 2022. So every council seat was up for re-election. And um, we were able to locate 30 out of the 32 boroughs manifestos. Um, there were two that we did, couldn't get in the end. We couldn't find them. I, I looked everywhere possible, but weren't, wasn't able to locate those. Um, but just first, I think, worth noting the, the difference in the sort of the style of the manifesto. So. Some were, you know, two pages on, on A4 and you know, text, no pictures kind of thing, um, right up to the largest one, which was 80 pages of, of information, of pledges, of commitment, promises, sometimes referring back to um, previous uh, periods of government, what they've done, you know, what they've got up to, uh, and going forward as well for the next four years. Um, so out of the 30, the top listed thing was housing. So every manifesto had a reference to housing. Um, whether that be new homes for private buyers, um, social rent homes, council homes, more to be built. That was something that was across every single manifesto, very high up there as well, either pledges on building more homes. There was also some references to um, repairing, so retrofitting, coming into the sort of the climate um, and emergency crisis, which I'll talk a little bit uh, more on later. Um, but so that was very high top and it's no surprise, I think, you know, living in London being a very populated area, people needing to be in places and decent places at that as well. So it's thinking about where they can put these kind of things and, and what links to that as well. And I think what was interesting is that the highest next um, uh, items or themes that were highlighted were community, um, community health and um, well-being uh, and crime and safety as well. So I think they're very kind of linked towards that place element. So thinking about homes and housing and what that sort of looks like and feels like for people. And it's really heartening to see community up there quite highly, um, something that a lot of the councils are really taking on board um, and that there's many reasons why that is important, of course, you know, communities are massively important and there's diverse communities across London, of course. So certain manifestos would speak to certain communities um, and, you know, really highlight what the sort of the, the differences um, can be brought together. Um, so it was really interesting to see that that is high on the agendas as well, as again, you would kind of expect. With the health element, it was um, a lot of references to, um, to coming out of COVID actually. So thinking about what is next for people as we come out of the pandemic uh, proper, as we've seen over the last couple of years and what that looks like for people. And that, that safety aspect as well, you know, being um, looked after, you know, well-being, mental health was mentioned quite a few times. Um, and you, you'd find this certainly in the inner boroughs, so, you know, where we are quite densely populated, there's a lot going on, um, there's probably more deprivation as well. And um, so they are highlighted in those particular areas. Um, and crime and safety was high up there also. And quite specifically, and a lot of the manifestos did call out violence against women and girls. So that was specifically put in manifestos as pledges to do more on that. Um, and just a word on, on, so it was either sort of pledges or they were promises to do certain things. And the way that I reviewed the manifestos was whatever they had committed to within the four year period um, of you know, what would be their sort of elected term, because obviously every four years there's a cycle. So if they are not able to carry on with their manifesto commitments then what they might look like would differ the next time round. Um, but the yeah, violence against women and girls was something that was called out quite specifically. Um, the climate emergency, again, um, there'll be a report coming out to accompany this webinar, uh, there's a blog also, and it will go into some more figures in, in terms of that, um, because the climate emergency was, was high on many agendas, again, quite significant in the inner boroughs, you know, built up areas, there's a lot of people um, sort of living and having to, um, you know, get through quite a lot of difficult circumstances at the moment, so it's that balance of, well, you know, not getting so far ahead with um, things such as low traffic uh, neighbourhoods, which you know, feature quite highly in the manifestos, but I know from a, a local uh, sort of level, ground level, they're quite controversial, but but necessary also. Um, so there is a lot of um, pledges to plant more trees. 
Um, in fact, one borough alone has pledged to plant one million trees, um, essentially building a new forest, uh, or planting a new forest, I should say, um, such as their commitment to sort of you know, cleaner air. And I think that as well lends itself to health and well-being, thinking about green spaces. Um, there is um, you know, the ability to get out and about in, in sort of nature. You know, seeing a bit of green is always good. Um, and many pledges to install a lot more electric vehicle charging points um, and cycle hangers or spaces for cycles as well. So I think we're seeing that shift toward um, more kind of active travel, active transport is, is what it's more colloquially known as. So not using cars, but um, using um, you know, sort of electric bikes, scooters and the like. Um, but taking into account what that, you know, if we're trying to encourage people to walk, that there needs to be um, decent space for everyone to use, you know, pavements properly um, and the space for these active transport vehicles to be used as well. Um, what wasn't reported so much or highlighted so much were things such as um, uh, digital. And when I, when I reviewed the, the manifesto, for me, digital was um, referring to people and accessibility to digital aspects. You know, we're moving to a more digital, uh, uh, a digital world thinking about things such as um, health access and so, you know, seeing your GP. Uh, we had that during the sort of the COVID pandemic, there are lots more face-to-face -face interactions. Um, but what there, there wasn't a, many um, references to people who may be digi digitally disadvantaged. And this isn't just older people, you know, because a lot of older people are very uh, capable of using um, up-to-date technology, but people who may be ec economically disadvantaged. So, they don't have, um, sorry, my speaker's going from the background. Um, and the way in which people can access that. So high-speed internet, for example, you know, a lot of things these days require quite high-speed internet to be able to work properly. Um, and just access to tablets, devices that people may need. Um, and I think digital as well, when we come to think of our homeless population, um, which wasn't mentioned a huge amount in any of the manifestos, but thinking about if we're moving toward a more digital techno technological kind of society, then we need to think about how everyone can access those. Um, and then arts and culture, creativity, another area that wasn't didn't get a huge mention unless it was from a borough which already has that kind of um, uh, system within it. So Camden, for example, is a very arts focused borough. So that's something that they will, you know, they've highlighted a lot or if there's another kind of connection. So um, again, in Enfield, they have um, Netflix, have built a film studio in Enfield. So they're talking about, you know, sort of creative jobs up to a thousand of those in that industry because they've got that sort of hook there, if you will. But people thinking about um, arts and creativity from a mental health point of view, for example, arts, health and well-being, you know, are known to go well together. There wasn't much of that sort of thought process, I thought, within the, the manifestos that I reviewed. Um, and then finally from me on and what wasn't mentioned so much was um, hate crime, so a specific call out with hate crime across all types of um, protected characteristics, whether it be sexual orientation, um, disability, religion, um, there were not specific mentions on that. I mean, I live in a borough which is, um, it has the second highest rates of hate crime in, in London, um, which is in Lambeth and, and Westminster has the, the highest actually, again, so central kind of areas that we're talking about. So. You know, seeing a bit more of that, I think, um, uh, where um, manifestos are talking directly to particular types of community. Um, but yeah, that, so that's my high level overview. As I say, that there, there, are company, that there will be accompanying um, documentation to go into a bit more detail. Um, but I hope that's helpful to uh, get the conversation started. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, it's really helpful to have that, as you say, the sort of top line and top line view of some of the issues which um, are coming through, as well as some of the areas that potentially aren't. And I think that's um, as useful a topic um, for discussion as well. Um, so I'm going to um, come over um, to our other panelists now, just for your kind of initial take uh, or reflections um, on what Chris has said. Um, Rob, can I come to you first? Thanks, Helen. <coughs> Thanks, Chris a really useful piece of analysis, um, which I've already shared with my team, because uh, this is the kind of stuff we develop at the Centre for London. Um, I mean, I, it, maybe it's worth sort of zooming out a bit, because uh, part of what we do as London Think Tank is 
try and think uh, a bit longer term about the big challenges facing London. And um, maybe we're able to be a bit more provocative about where, where we might go and what's not going so well in the city. Um, and just try and draw out some maybe gaps that we see from our latest work on London's future and this set of priorities that you've identified so, so well. Um, so we, we set up this program called London Futures a couple of years ago, and it's concluded now when it was a sort of two step process involving lots of London's uh, key organisations, really just trying to sort of sketch out a new roadmap for the future. And I, I, without sort of boring you with the detail, there are two reports online if you want to look at it. Um, we sort of drew the conclusion that London had lots of pressing challenges, new ones, especially around a Brexit, COVID recovery, uh, a sort of slipping international status and various other things that it really needed to address. And we kind of came up with a formula, if you like, for, for how we might think about that and, and therefore how to set priorities for the future. And by and large, we ended up pretty optimistic about where London could go, even despite the kind of knocks of COVID. And, and, our, and our kind of formula for where we, where we should head over the long run really rested on two tenets. One was we should, in effect, boost the kind of connectivity of the place. And by that, I mean not just the transport network, but also, and, and Chris has already talked about this, the sort of digital connectivity of us, all Londoners, or future Londoners, and of London itself. Uh, so that's access, but also improving the infrastructure so that it works better for everyone. Um, but also, and this is a crucial point, um, we make the city work better for human connections. So that's beyond just being able to move around and being able to connect digitally. It's literally down to what do our town centres look like? What do our parks look like? How much do they foster bringing people together? Because it's that bringing people together that produces London's magic or secret source, if you like. You know, and from there, all of our great stuff comes. Now, obviously, this is against the backdrop of huge challenges in the city, you know, not least uh, vast uh, poverty uh, and a kind of challenging political environment. But to cut to the chase, uh, on these two tenets of, uh, sorry, first tenet was uh, connectivity. Second tenet was, okay, fine, we need to drive this dynamism, but we also need to sort of raise all boats and protect everyone. This sense of needing to be protected and protect each other really rose through the pandemic, obviously. But I think it reflects a deeper seated desire to look after our citizens better. So our 10 sort of, I won't bore you with all of them, but we essentially came up with 10 priorities for the long run. And many of them are reflected in the list that we've just gone through. Um, get post carbon straight away, you know, as fast as possible, pro nature stuff. I mentioned connectivity. One that you haven't mentioned so far is being a welcoming city. So how do we bring in newcomers, both the sort of, you know, well-off and talented, but also those most in need. For us, that felt like a really important point, both about our sort of moral position in the world, but also about driving our dynamism. Uh, making it a learning city. So a brilliant place to do learning. It already is pretty good. It could be better. And that helps drive our future prosperity and our ability to raise all, you know, uh, raise everyone up. Um, the other kind of key ones is about affordability, which really has come, I think, bigger since the, the, the cost of living crisis. So we really called out that all Londoners should be able to afford essentials. I don't think that's as clear in these borough uh, manifestos, probably because they don't want to be held to that because they can't deliver it. But we are in a more privileged place where we can say, you know, London as a whole should achieve this. Not more privileged, but more flexible, if you like. Um, we definitely called out housing. By the way, this process was all fed by us talking to groups like yourselves, but also doing new polling and innovative techniques to find out what Londoners really value for the long run, which is a surprisingly difficult question to pose and get good answers for. We also called out uh, addressing the factors causing poor, poor health, which I think is broadly reflected in this set. When we talked to Londoners, the big thing that came out, which surprised us, was uh, number one was safety. Um, this is partly uh, accelerated, I think, or grown by what was happening at the time we did the 
for work in the pandemic. But I think it, again, reflects a sort of longer uh, rising trend or, and desire to improve everyone's safety. And then the last one, which is the kind of technocratic one that us policy wonks like a lot, is how do we sort of change the structures and, and set up of London so that it works better for the city against all these priorities? And again, that's something that for boroughs, it's quite hard to sort of put that in there. I think we're starting to see some of that maybe in places which have had the biggest changes. So the Westminster Commission is perhaps an example of wanting to really just take a clean look at the borough and what and how we might achieve some of the other sort of social and economic and environmental priorities. So I th hopefully that sort of picks out a few areas where there's both linkages with work we've done and some of the some of the gaps. Brilliant, thank you, Rob. Um, really, really interesting to see you know where those this kind of issues were touching on what you know have come through from London Futures, um, and I think. You know some of those points that I think Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, weren't as, as present in the manifestos as well. And obviously, the, the tension of what local boroughs can do and what's sort of within their um, remit. But yeah, certainly the point around being a welcoming city, I think that's a really interesting one um, to come back to. Um, you raised affordability as a you know a key um, issue that had come through your review. Um, so I'm going to use that as a kind of segue uh, to bring Jahanara in. Um, because I guess particularly from, from where you sit um, in the housing um, world, obviously housing, as Chris said, was very high on the agenda of all boroughs. Um, but I wonder, yeah, from if you could sort of share any um, reflections on what you thought that might mean, you know, scratching beneath, it's a very big, big topic. Um, you mentioned kind of house building, but um, yeah, what, what would you reflect on, on what's come through those manifestos? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so I think it was welcome to see housing as such a priority event for many boroughs across London at the local elections. Um, and obviously we saw some shifts in some of the key boroughs as well. Um, and I think that kind of tells a story about the, the sort of, if you like, the priorities for, for the residents in, in those particular boroughs. Um, and we think that that may mean some changes in housing plans across some of those boroughs. Um, what one of the things that we've kind of reflected on and we've looked at um, as an example, we know there's a real um, sort of need for affordable housing across London. I mean, I live in East London, um, but if you want to get a three bed, um, you know, rented property in the private sector, you're looking at minimum uh, £2,000, which often is outside of the reach of most working Londoners. Um, and then on the other side, I think we've sort of looked at sort of the planning statistics um, up on Dulac, um, and it showed three boroughs that had the fewest planning proposals. Um, and, and it suggests there's some resistance, um, but we really want to work in partnership with our local authority partners and see where the need is and what makes sense in terms of new housing, new affordable housing to meet that particular challenge. Um, the, there are a significant waiting lists. I'm, I'm going to be preaching to the converted here. Um, but an example um, is in Lambeth, where we have a lot of housing stock and we're kind of starting a large regeneration, which is going to have about seven and a half thousand new properties over the next um, 10, 15 years. But there's a current waiting list of 30,000 people. And often those are the people that actually meet that housing allocation criteria. What a lot of people don't recognise is the kind of housing that we provide, most of the housing that we provide, housing associations, it comes through the allocations process and people who are successful, who get to the top of the line, are people who come with a lot of social issues. Um, and that really works well in the sense that we are, as organisations, because we are social housing, what that means is we have a social purpose. It's just not about the bricks and mortar. Um, we do more of it. And, and I think some of the... Um, sort of elements that you picked out, Chris, kind of really are, are the things that we as housing associations respond to in addition to um, the, the kind of housing need. Um, and we work in partnership um, with lots and lots of um, uh, local authorities. And we want to see what that sort of response to the housing crisis looks like in partnership with others. 
Um, we've recently been able to um, secure some funding um, from the Affordable Homes Programme, which will mean over the next five years, we'll be building another two and a half thousand properties. On the other side, um, that fund has also been given out to outside of London for the first time, and that may, will make um, it more difficult for housing associations to build as many homes as we would like to. Um, so there's some challenges for us in terms of the structural stuff that we are facing. And I think the one little point I want to make is I think there can be a perception, I think, at the government level that, um, that London is, is, is a wealthy city and it doesn't have uh, a sort of equal uh, levels of deprivation. And actually, there are some real significant pockets that we see that we work in the deprivation levels are really, really bad. And, and it's, it's all sorts of things. It's that connectivity thing that um, been referenced already, the poverty levels. In every single borough that we operate in, we are supporting some kind of food provision. We're working with partners around that. So um, at that very basic level, and, and, and those are not necessarily uh, people just on benefits. Those are people who are working people. Um, and I think there's an opportunity just on that housing point for us to kind of work creatively to see what the solutions are around housing with, with partners like our local authorities. Um, just going back to our sort of role as housing associations and our social value purpose, um, what I'm responsible for is what we call our community investment um, department. And, and essentially what that does is really uh, try to undif undif identify the needs that our, uh, our residents are facing, whether that be, you know, struggling with the cost of living crisis, whether they're struggling with their mental well-being, whether that's their digital um, connectivity issues. We respond to all of that and we provide sort of hands-on support where we can and we work in communities. So that thing about communities being a big part of the manifestos, I mean, we're really encouraged by that because it really speaks to what we're trying to do and have been trying to do for a long time, because we don't think that actually, um, particularly on the back of the pandemic, I think a lot of people feel like they can actually solve their own problems. Um, and we see our, our, our role as sort of supporting communities to solve, you know, to identify their own problems, um, find the solutions. And if we can work with them, bring in resources, however that may be, we're there to do that um, because I genuinely think that that's where um, the opportunity is. Um, the other thing I think, again, it goes without saying here, the it's kind of the challenge in housing, particularly as I've sort of referenced around um, sort of the private rented sector. Um, and I've just got a little stat that I'm just going to read out. Um, rent is obviously really, really high in London. The average rent is about 1425 versus 755 in England as a whole. Um, and then although our sort of wages in London are higher than elsewhere, um, the median home in England costs nine times the median salary. Um, and in London, the figure is 14 times the median. So I think it just shows the kind of challenge that London has faced around um, housing particularly. And this is where I think housing associations or social housing has such an important role to play, whether that be you know, proper social housing where you get the really subsidised uh, homes that you have to go through that council waiting list for, or whether it's the affordable home products that we have, which is sort of, um, which has a slight reduction on the, uh, on the sort of market rent. Um, we would be willing to put lots more different products out there that is far more affordable for people in London, but the funding has to work. The funding models don't currently work as much um, as they did maybe 20 years ago where the structure of so, uh, how, um, grants to social housing providers to build homes was far more generous. Um, and then just speaking about something very specific we've done in the last uh, few months is we commissioned a re report on um, young people and housing. So it, we work, we, we work with young house, uh, young people and to try and really understand what their needs are. And I, we understand that actually there's a real role for us to play to create positive pathways for young people. And then touching on that safety factor and particularly in some localities across London, I think that thing of um, serious violence affecting young people 
we don't talk about gangs and violence, we talk about serious um, violence affecting young people, because those young people, even if they are uh, involved in it, they are also victims because of the sort of socio-economic issues around why they've ended up there. Um, so we see a real role in, in, in sort of um, supporting young people, kind of create those positive pathways. So the research that we commissioned looked at young people and their housing aspirations. And the, what the findings said was that 60% of young people um, said thinking about their future housing situation is actually affecting their mental health. Um, and they didn't feel that with the cost of housing in London, they, they could necessarily live where they lived. They, they really genuinely felt that they would have to move away from their local connections, from their family. Um, it was affecting the sort of choices that they were thinking about making um, and um, just genuinely really think about moving away from home. Um, but at the same time, young people really wanted to feel that they had a stake in the local area and to be able to buy a home in the area they already live in. And then when you think about sort of the journey that a lot of young people from disadvantaged um, backgrounds have, that can be really, really challenging. So for them to stay where they are, ultimately, you know, own their own home, it almost feels like um, a sort of an unachievable goal for many young people. So it's really, really sobering. And I just thought that that's something that should could be picked up um, by the political parties. Um, and then the final thing that we, I, I think was really important to pick out was that young people also said that they needed a better education at school about the ha housing options open to them. I think it goes back to that whole life skills that young people get taught um, through the research and, and outside of the research. We hear a lot about young people not really understanding what the landscape is, what their options are. Um, and there's some real opportunity to kind of really upskill young people um, about what those pathways could be for them, not just in housing, but in other, other sort of um, uh, employability, um, their sort of um, social mobility as well. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I'm just gonna um, finish what I want to say with a few key asks, I, I, I would say to all the political parties. Um, that we'd be to be able to address all the challenges identified, we need sustainable long term funding from central government to be able to achieve our ambitions alongside local councils. Um, we would welcome greater partnership working with local councils on shared ambitions, including addressing the housing crisis, uh, supporting residents and tackling climate change. And I think today speaks a lot about that, that we're all affected by this. And I think from a housing perspective, I was speaking to a colleague earlier today about we need to think about the sort of infrastructure that we have uh, within the homes that we build, because actually the homes that we have are not equipped for what climate change will mean for the homes that people live in in the future. Um, local authority planning, um, to build the homes we need, we need to see planning teams approving developments that benefit the local community. And sometimes there's a lot of political arguments against um, some developments that could actually be affordable and achievable for uh, local local people and the final one local councils and housing associations can work together to give residents a greater voice in how their homes are run as well as what services and activities are available in their community so that's me thank you very much and a huge amount in there i think both in terms of you know housing specifically we're not you know Housing means a lot of things, but I think in this context, particularly the right housing for, for Londoners and that those um, points around this kind of choice and aspirations, I think is really key and goes back to um, your point, Rob, earlier about the, you know, this is the, the sense of place we have um, for people living in the city um, and enabling that um, to, you know, to happen. Um, I wonder actually, Rob or Chris, if you wanted to come back on anything, um, that Jahanara has raised, because I think, um, Chris, certainly in the, the manifesto analysis, there was quite a bit around um, young people and um, what, what um, parties were looking at in terms of better supporting um, young people in London, um, but also that point around partnerships and collaboration. Did you see much in terms of, you know, that appetite to work both with local communities differently, um, but also with the organisations um, in the city? On the young person point, there was it, it was one of the most raised issues actually in the manifestos. But I think what um, Janara has, has raised there is actually they're thinking about the here and now rather than sort of the, the future. So 
you know, talking about what the educational requirements are for our young people to go out into, you know, sort of the, the world of, um, of housing, of um, finance, you know, thinking about pensions, that kind of thing. You know, that's the sort of conversation I think would be good to start happening now. And that there's not that kind of element in there that I come through, uh, that I saw through the manifestos. It's more about, and there are, of course, you know, immediacies that need attention. Um, but I think this needs to be backed up with a sort of two-pronged approach of, well, let's think about the future as well. Um, and just in, in terms of a bit of a sort of a, um, a declaration, I actually ran as a councillor candidate in this most recent local election. Um, I wasn't successful, but hey ho. Um, and I was talking to families whose you know, parents had lived in the area, in their community, and they were so concerned that their children are not going to be able to live where their family have lived for quite a few generations, in mm -hmm. fact, in terms of you know, their their support network, the, the family, the extended family around them as well, and where they think they are going to have to go. So to hear that child, young people are thinking about that, how that's affecting their mental health, I'm going to have to leave my support network here, you know, my, and there's no longer that kind of ability to, um, I can't remember the name of the process, but, you know, if, if your parents were in the council, then you would be able to sort of take it on as well. All of that's being swept away. Mm. So I can un really understand the fact that young people are thinking, well, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? You know, and having to take that into account with everything else that is happening. Um, yeah, it's really disheartening to hear. So the, there wasn't that kind of long termism, if you will. There was more about the immediacy, which I get. I do appreciate, of course. Um, but yeah, that, that's really, that's really quite something I hadn't taken into account before. Um, Jan and I had actually spoken about that. Thanks, Chris. Um, Rob, anything you want to come in on? I mean, just sort of maybe moving on a bit and addressing some of the points in the, that come up in the q and A. I I think it's probably worth saying that one of our conclusions from our work recently is uh, not, not, a, not a, a sort of, uh, it didn't take a genius to get to this point. One of our conclusions in the London Futures work was that the kind of levelling up um, dialogue, discourse, which may soon be ending, who knows, with the Prime Minister changing, uh, is a real threat to London. And so our sort of successor programme of work has been around levelling up. First of all, looking at what the real levelling up challenges are in London. By the way, if you want to look at that borough by borough, there's data on our website. And then the second phase, which we're, uh, we're going to be starting soon, we'll look at sort of changing or uh, unpacking London's contribution and London's place in the UK and the world, which I think uh, is a very helpful, maybe not the only way to, to address some of the, the comments that we made about long-termism and, and, um, and governance. But just to illustrate why this kind of matters, and it's, it's pretty obvious when you're sort of observing the London scene, but, you know, London is, uh, on the back of May, London looks like it's, diverging really away from, from England, certainly, politically. And that just creates more rub between City Hall and the boroughs and, um, and national government. And that really, uh, you know, is a huge problem. Just to illustrate, you know, TfL funding settlement, you know, if we, if we, we're not gonna achieve the things that we've described in, in our work and, and others, uh, if we have a completely hobbled or uh, managed down transport network. That's just not going to work. You know, that's bleeding obvious to everyone. Yet the current uh, impasse between City Hall and um, uh, DFT and Number 10 is just, you know, that's hurting the city. Second thing, maybe less obvious, but the second prong really of, on decarbonisation and the major challenge we have there is that we need policies which drive us to, to stop burning gas in our homes to heat. Simple. We need a framework that makes that happen with the right levels of support for the right kinds of people. And that is completely absent nationally. And it's even more absent in London where there are higher challenges. Some of the analysis we've done shows that because of tenure, because of uh, the, the building types we have in London, that's going to be harder to achieve in London than elsewhere. So we radically need rapidly better policy that fits for London for the big challenges we face now. And that's not going to happen without getting the conversation right about levelling up, and arguably not really going to happen without quite radical reform or certainly different financing methods uh, and different regulation that, that helps uh, 
foster the right kind of things happening in our homes and on our streets. So hopefully that sort of illustrates some of the peril, I think, of the cities in the moment. Thank you, Rob. Um, and you've reminded me to, yeah, check, check in on um, some questions that have come through. Um, from people listening. Um, I'm going to come to a question from John Griffiths, um, which you might have seen, which um, talks, you know, building on that point about needing the long view, um, but a particular question about whether any of the manifestos kind of really offer a radical rethink. Um, and uh, I know, uh, John, Rob, you were sort of touching on that there, but were there any other models or, or other, you know, you referenced the Westminster Commission, other boroughs that you could, you're aware of where they are sort of taking that um, kind of bottom up community wealth building approach? And if not, um, do we need more of them? How, how can we sort of encourage, I suppose, or, or where, where might the opportunities be for that? Maybe just to take that in two parts. Um, community wealth building, I know boroughs are interested in it. Some of them are partners with us on uh, a piece of research we're doing now on, on this topic. Um, so that mm, I, ho I hope will bear fruit in terms of new ideas, new policy options. I think it's worth saying as well that some pretty interesting approaches have been adopted around climate, for example, um, uh, to take a more bottom up sort of deliberative, inclusive approach. You know, Camden, Lambeth, I know Southwark um, have been pretty strong in using models like citizens assemblies. What they don't address really and they don't really have a remit to do is what are the kind of big bits of furniture that we might want to shuffle around to make big improvements. One of the things we've been quite strong on, backed by our work um, of late, has been, for example, around safety and policing. This is a really live topic. You know, the Met Police is currently on the naughty step. But there are other forces too um, where that's true, but the, the Met Police is in special measures in effect. And um, this should be a really good moment to rethink policing and safety in London uh, and kind of, you know, uh, allow ourselves to think uh, uh, pretty radically. I mean, we've essentially advocated for um, uh, sort of the scrapping of the Met in its current form and a rebirth along the lines of what happened in Northern Ireland, um, which was a huge step forwards in the peace process. And we're advocating for something sort of similarly radical um, here at the moment because it feels like it, it needs it and that the Met is currently quite broken. But that, you know, you can't get big changes like that without really getting to big crunchy issues about governance. Who's really in charge? Where does the money really come from? Who's going to pay for it? All those things. They're all tied together. So we, we, we've got to provoke these conversations a bit better. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm going to come back with a, a question um, for, for, for you all. Um, obviously, the, you know, the issues that we're talking about, they're, they're big, big issues for our members thinking as, you know, um, a membership of the funding community across London. Um, you know, some of these will be issues that are already, you know, very much on their, on their radar, on their kind of funding programmes. Um, and it was interesting for us to, to kind of marry up you know these themes against um the results from our member order earlier in the year to see kind of if there's alignment or not with some of the you know the issues that we know have been funded um, or that funders are able to invest in um but thinking i guess particularly about the independent funding sector as well as their local authority partners um are there particular opportunities do you think for that wider funding community um to to look at these issues which you know seemingly are are higher on the political agenda um, over the next four years. Um, one point, just by way of context, as an example, is we, we've heard, you know, climate change, um, environmental issues, big, big thing coming through manifestos. Um, currently, only 4% of our, our members describe themselves as funding in this space. You know, what, what might we want to see um, in terms of the wider funding um, community um, in terms of these issues? Anyone free to take Jahanara? Um, I'll, I'll go down the really practical route. I think there's two things for me um, and they're kind of umbrella things. So I think there's a real opportunity for um, funders to think about the cost of living crisis. It's not a flash in the pan. Um, it may go on for several years and already we're kind of seeing, you know, it feels like the peak, but I don't think it's the peak. It's 
it's kind of broader. And I think it's thinking broadly about who are the stakeholders who have a stake in trying to support support this um, crisis um, and broadening that scope of partnership so that actually it is organizations like ours, it is the local authority, it may even be small community organizations and it might be that Mrs. Jones who knits, who used to knit um, face masks during the pandemic, that she might have the answer and it's kind of that building that flexibility in because I think in this period there's, there's a real um, kind of almost all every, everybody's attention is going on the sort of hand to mouth day to day what am I going to do today and people aren't able to think and actually if we're going to come out of where we are with the inflation and, and the growth needed in the country I think people also need the headspace to be able to think about well actually I might want to invest in my you know future so I'll do that night you know course so I can get that job that might pay me a little bit more that I can move on um, and I think funders need perhaps to sort of be flexible in 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 approaches and the criteria that they set because as I said earlier I think often it is you know the community that sort of knows what its problems are sort of knows what the solutions are that it wants um, and be, having the openness to to kind of uh, work with that and then the other one I think with the climate change piece I think um, I think there is still scepticism, you know, even across London, you know, um, about is this real or is this, you know, a, a sort of a nice little heat wave and, and it's all fine. Um, and I think there's a real education piece um, to get everybody to understand what this is and, and not actually explore from a funder community what their role might be in that, um, because there's a lot of work that, you know, we do, but I mean, we've been thinking about simple things like, you know, create lots of allotments so you know when Rob was talking about the million trees you know, how do we get our communities involved in things like that so it feels relevant it's not something a big organization that's kind of invested and they're going to be um you know planting it and it's going to be you know people from a certain background certain class who take part in that it needs to become something that everybody else is interested in and I think that engagement piece in that bigger debate getting communities involved and I think there's a role potentially with funders because it is relevant, it's it's getting more relevant by the day, um, and I think it's about the, how do, how do funders make that more of a relevant but to everyday people. Thank you. Um, anything, Rob or Chris, you want to? Yeah, if I can, I, I, there's a question in there actually about um, something optimistic um, about the next four years over, the, and I'd like to come in on that actually. Um, and it, it links into some of the other questions that are in here um, about the way in which we are starting to work together at a system level. Um, so we've got integrated care systems coming in across London. So there'll be five in total. And that would see um, the NHS trusts, GP surgeries working closer together with local authorities. Now something like this has been sort of done before. It's another reorganization essentially. But I'm working at that from a particular angle in terms of what I do in my other roles as well. Um, and I really see the benefit and it's what Johanara said about communities and them knowing what it is they need and want. So that there's a movement within that called thriving communities. And it's talking about how people can become more involved in what it is that's happening around them and being given that support mechanism to do so. And funders would be able to get behind something like that because it's straight in at the community level. If they choose to do so, you don't need to go through the council to do this. You know, you, the thriving community itself will put on an event and could you use a community event that says this estate is having an event, a get to know your neighbours kind of style event. So, you know, come along and say hello to people. And the knock on effect of that could be that somebody who felt isolated or lonely has got to meet some people and they feel less so. So they don't feel they need to go to see a GP, for example. So there are elements of that behind this kind of um, process, but I think they're worthwhile. And I think that long term piece is that it is that giving confidence or actually rather it's allowing the flexibility of the funding to say, well, this is a community group. It's not something we may, we may be recognized as a structured organization that we give money to and it does this, this, and this. You know, this may just be a couple of thousand pounds to put on an event and there may not be a specific outcome from that, but that doesn't matter in terms of a you know, qualitative thing. It's that you've joined that community up and they've come together and they've been able to you know, sort of speak and get together. So that's a really important thing. Um, and just finally, on the there's a question in there about um, uh, the administration kind of stars. You know, is there a different way of doing things? 
um, about um, uh, what was talking about the way in which community uh, sort of councils are sort of constituted, I suppose. Um, I because I'm a bit of a geek, there, there was an element I put in there which is called council administration. So where a manifesto said we will make our council more accountable, for example, and that did get a tick, but that was the lowest of all of the scores that I went through. So less than half of councils had anything to do with that. Um, and that could be things like citizens assembly, as we've been talking about, you know, so when it comes to climate change, giving more impetus to citizens on those things. I mentioned low traffic neighborhoods. They're a good thing. I think they're necessary, but they're happening to people at the moment rather than people being involved in the sort of conversation about what that means and how it could affect them. So th there are these kind of elements that are um, being used to be more uh, interactive with our you know, residents and things like that. So um, yeah, there, there, there is more coming down and I think it can continue actually. Can, can I um, just build on that and maybe flip the telescope around? Um, because that's a very good point about community building uh, clearly. But I maybe I would say this as a think tank that likes to do the long thinking. But I would urge uh, funders to sort of dare to invest in strategic thinking a bit more, because uh, you know some of these, as we've gone through, some of these are big, knotty system level issues um, that we're not going to unpick unless we sort of dare to go there a bit. Um, your point on climate. Funding is really uh, true. Yes, it's growing. Yes, there is money arriving. But as someone whose day job or part of my day job at least is to find people who are willing to invest in some new policy thinking for London on climate, it's very, very hard. There should be a lot more of that. London does have specific, as I've mentioned, specific climate related problems are not the same as the rest of the UK. Um, and uh, the, the, the sort of climate steered money in the charity sector is not uh, attuned to that so there, there's a lot more we could do and you know we did say this was an emergency i believe it is an emergency but i also believe we're not acting like it's an emergency we paid lip service in 2019 and we've done not a great deal since you know in terms of real impact so we need to move fast Thanks, Rob. So a call for yeah investment in that longer term strategic thinking, um, and uh, you know alongside that on the other end, as as Chris um, was saying, you know the flexibility for kind of community led um, action as well on you know it, it be on a different scale, but you know the value of, of all of that um, together. Um, we're we're drawing to a slight close to our two o'clock finish, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who's uh, sat sweltering here in my in my uh, bedroom. Um, but I would like to just end, if I could, on asking um, all of the panel, and um, which a couple of you have, have started to move on um, actually. But you know, what what action would you like to see? Um, kind of following, you know, this discussion. You know, this might be something for the funding sector. It could be something you'd like to see happen at a local level. Um, for, for us as Londoners. Um, and if you haven't answered this other question, um, which came up in the Q&A, what's the reason to be optimistic? You know, we've talked about some very, as you said, tricky long-term issues that have been around a long time, as well as some that are fast, you know, gaining pace, not least the cost of living crisis. Um, as we move forward to the next four years, can you share a reason to be optimistic on what we can do um, collectively? So anybody want to go first? I'm happy to kick off. Um, I mean, just echoing my last point, really, you know, I think on the funder side, finding quite quickly new coalitions of the willing uh, to tackle our biggest challenges, from crime and safety to decarbonisation to affordability, and protecting uh, the most vulnerable in London today and tomorrow uh, would be what I would call for. That's pretty vague, but I hope you get the point. And then, and then my optimism is really just born of London and its history. You know, London is one of the most successful cities this planet has ever seen. Um, it grew to 9 million people because we got a lot right and we continue to get a lot right. And I see no reason really, having thought about it pretty hard for the last two years, probably harder than most, um, why if we do the right things, uh, continue to sort of work as a, a community, 
uh, that we can't continue to make London one of the best places uh, in the world. Thanks, Rob. Johanara? So um, leading on from Rob, I think London is amazing. Um, and I think that's the one thing that we, we can be really uh, positive about, because I think irrespective of the sort of changing landscape from a political ideology perspective, I think the unique thing about London and London as it is, is that we kind of are thinkers and we know what's right for London. And I think that kind of plays out um, at local elections, general elections. So I think that's one of the things that makes me really happy to be a Londoner. And I, you know, um, so I think that's one thing. And then similar to, again to Rob about the ask, I think, um, the ask again, it just goes back to my point about that sort of, um, that partnership, that kind of partnership approach to addressing the things that are really, really important to Londoners and impacting on Londoners. And I think for me as well, it's, it's, it's kind of doing two parallel things. One, yes, have the strategic discussions, strategic plans, but I often observe that there's a lot of talk. So, you know, when you come around a big issue, you have years of discussion about the ins and outs of something. And actually there's very little doing that actually happens. And I think we just need to kind of balance that because sometimes we just navel gaze far too much. And particularly around some of the more pressing issues facing Londoners, whether that be housing, climate change, the cost of living crisis. I think action at this point for the next few years is, is, is really, really important. Thank you. Um, and Chris, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, I think that sort of you know, goes down the scale then. So we're talking about strategic, Joe and I are talking about both together. And I think for me, in terms of community, it's, it's the community aspect that I'm most optimistic about. Um, if there's anything to be sort of learned from COVID, it's the infrastructure that is still actually there. I know in Lambeth, they're still using that for certain things, like, you know, food hubs, for example, but also the community aspect of people doing things for others, that's still existing, so we can capitalise on that. And that's where funding can come at that level as well. And just keep people in that sort of, you know, positive, optimistic, we can help each other out, absolutely. Well, on that optimistic note, um, I'm going to um, draw us to a close. I have been informed by my colleague that unfortunately the chat um, function was, was disabled during that webinar, so we do apologise for that. Um, but if you go onto the London Funders um, website under the Resources and Publications tab, um, you'll see um, the analysis, there's a slide pack and there's some interactive maps and charts where you can look at this data um, to your heart's content. So just a final huge thank you to our panel um, and for everybody else who's joined us. Um, yeah, we will, we will draw to a close then and look forward to picking up um, some of these discussions, which has been really, really um, interesting in some of our wider work at London Funders um, over the coming months. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.